Brazilian group mm -hmm. at a time when Brazil uh, certainly feels itself to have uh, been doomed and perhaps still to be doomed. The feeling is not a great deal better uh, in the United States, but there has been, of course, a political change here, uh, as well as a significant success with vaccine rollout. So I would say the feelings of doom are beginning to, uh, to diminish in the North. And perhaps one might also say the same of the United Kingdom and Europe. What I'm going to do is uh, show you a few slides and summarize the arguments of my book. I'll spend maybe 25 minutes doing that to leave uh, 30 minutes for discussion. And I'm going to therefore share my screen, uh, which will give you a rest from my my tired looking face. Uh, you may be wondering a little bit about my choice of, of book jacket. The idea uh, was to try to escape from uh, writing a book about COVID-19 and to signal that doom is a general history of disasters with an argument about their political nature. And in some ways, I found the image of a golfer calmly sinking a putt while a wildfire raged behind him, a rather beautiful representation of at least the American state of mind in the initial phase, not only of a pandemic, but of many other disasters that my book talks about. In order to save you reading the book, I've summarized it here, but I want to make it clear that you still have to buy it. Uh, and my children feel the same way uh, since you're financing their education. The idea of the book is that essentially history is one disaster after another. And yet we don't have a general history of, of catastrophe, which is strange. One reason for that is that we draw a false dichotomy between natural and man-made disasters. And I try to argue in the book that this is a mistake, that Amartya Sen was right when he said that famines are not natural disasters, they're man-made. But the same is true of every kind of disaster, that even geological disasters or climatic disasters only have or cause excess mortality insofar as human decision making allows that to happen. It, it doesn't matter if a volcano erupts on an uninhabited island, or it doesn't matter terribly much. But if you decide to build a city right next to the volcano and to rebuild it after the volcano erupts, then there's a man-made or person-made, if you prefer, nature to the disaster that happens when it next erupts. Another key argument of the book, which is highly relevant to your debates in Brazil today, is that not all disasters should simply be blamed on the person, man or woman at the top. Tempting though that is, often the point of failure in a disaster is actually in the middle, further down the chain of command. And if you conclude that it's all the fault of the person at the top, you may miss a systemic problem uh, that you need to fix by doing more than just getting a new president. The book also looked at the way in which contagions of the body and contagions of the mind can interact. I'll say a bit more about that later. Finally, and I think perhaps most importantly, I argue that we can't predict disasters. We just can't do that. They're in their very nature unpredictable. That's partly because disasters don't really follow uh, normal distributions that, that would allow us to at least attach probabilities. There's no way of knowing when the next really big earthquake will strike California, 
We just know that at some point one will. So you can't predict the timing of the next disaster or even which which disaster you'll get next. Will it be another pandemic or will it be a massive cyber attack? We don't know. It's therefore very important to be generally resilient or anti-fragile if you can, than to have one or two very bureaucratic plans for disasters that you don't get. So those are the arguments of the book. I've summed them up there. Um, I'm now gonna offer a little bit more detail. Uh, let's begin by asking how big this catastrophe has been, and we also need to bear in mind that it's not over. That figure of 3.5 or 3.6 million deaths in the Johns Hopkins uh, website, which many of you will know, is likely an underestimate. Uh, a bunch of recent attempts have been made to come up with a more realistic figure, assuming that there's large scale under measurements especially in uh, developing countries, puts the total maybe twice or more than uh, twice as high, could be 7.7 .7 million deaths, according to IHME, which is one of the epidemiological modeling uh, agencies in the United States. Uh, the Economist recently estimated excess mortality at between 7 and 13 million. So we are dealing with a significant uh, historical disaster. Uh, the US death toll is approaching 600,000. At its at peak, 3,500 Americans were dying every day. We're still looking at global deaths of eight to 10,000 uh, a day. But it's worth bearing in mind uh, that for the United States, this represented a 16% increase in the age-adjusted death rate in 2020. And COVID-19 was not the principal cause of death in the United States in 2020. It came in third after the usual suspects, heart disease and cancer. COVID caused roughly 11% of deaths. People die. I sometimes felt last year in some of the public policy discussion as if nobody was supposed to die. Uh, but in reality, uh, people die, and especially in, in the period after they reach the age of 65 or 70. One of the, the things about this pandemic that makes it hard to assess is that unlike almost every other pandemic I've studied, it disproportionately kills the old, people with relatively few life years left. Imagine how much worse it would have been if our kids had been as vulnerable as our parents and grandparents. And that's an important thing to bear in mind when you try to compare this disaster with other disasters. It's important to use excess mortality as a measure because the ways in which countries have recorded COVID deaths have varied widely. And I think this is a much more important and reliable measure. You can see from this Financial Times table that Brazil has had a very bad experience, but not the worst. Uh, as you're probably aware, a number of other Latin American countries have had much higher excess mortality, uh, Peru and Ecuador, uh, for example. Uh, the United States that feels uh, that it's been through some extraordinary calamity is actually in the middle of the, the distribution with respect to excess mortality. There are European countries as well as Latin American countries that have had a worse experience. So this is an important measure to bear in mind. You also notice that if you, you look at these charts, excess mortality came in waves. And this is true of pandemics throughout history. There are these waves, multiple waves usually, of excess mortality. I want to say more about that in a minute. But when you put these numbers into a really broad historical perspective, uh, you realize that COVID-19 has only just made it into the top 20 of pandemics in so, uh, with respect to the proportion of the world's population that it has killed. I think right now we're on 0.047% of the world's population, higher if you use the higher estimates. This is about three orders of magnitude smaller than the Black Death 
which we think killed about a third of human beings. There are also estimates for the plague of uh, the emperor Justinian that, uh, that, that come up with a similar staggering number of deaths. The 1918-19 influenza was much worse than COVID-19, maybe 30 or 40 times worse in terms of the share of the population of the world that it killed. And our uh, plague has only just overtaken the 1957-58 Asian flu, an episode which is almost entirely forgotten, uh, even by people who lived through it. One of the easiest things to anticipate last year when this began, and I remember saying it in January and February of last year, was that this would come in multiple waves. When epidemiologists said flatten the curve, they were already making a historical error because there was always going to be more than one curve pretty much everywhere. We knew that because it had happened in 1918 and in 1957-58 and in many other cases I could give you, but you can see here US data for the two great influenza pandemics. In the case of 1918-19, the second wave was worse than the first. This is an interesting uh, way of conceptualizing the American experience. This is the uh, excess mortality observed versus expected deaths going back to 2017. And you can see that in the United States, as in 1918-19, the second wave was worse, uh, quite a bit worse than the first wave. And bear in mind that I was writing Doom in the summer of last year and signed off on the the manuscript in October, after which I just had proofs to correct. So I was finishing the book before the, the peak of the second wave, which was around about Christmas. In the UK, by comparison, which also has good excess mortality data, the peak was actually in the spring of last year, and the second wave was not at the beginning, uh, was, not as, uh, was not bigger. Okay, let's put this into perspective. That's what historians are here for. That's what I try to do. If you look at the UK data, which go back all the way to the 1840s, the British have always been quite good at keeping statistics on this stuff. You can see that uh, 2020 uh, compares uh, with some other uh, years of disaster in British history, 1918, uh, 1940, and 1951. Uh, and in fact, uh, depending on how you calculate it, age adjusted or not, those years were worse. Uh, you can understand 1918, no doubt, 1940 is obvious enough, uh, but 1951, who now remembers the great British influenza epidemic of 1951? It's entirely forgotten. It was as bad, if not worse, than 2020 in terms of the mortality rate relative to the previous 10 year average, which is a good way of kind of identifying peaks in excess mortality. Here's the same thing done for the US data. The US has seen nothing as bad as this since 1918. And that's one reason I think that Americans have uh, reacted as they have. They've not really experienced such a peak in uh, mortality uh, for over a century. The, uh, the influenza pandemics and epidemics don't really show up in the US data in the way that they do in the British data. But the economic impact of COVID has been out of proportion to its public health impact. And that is its historically significant feature. The 1957-58 influenza pandemic had no economic consequences that one can detect. Life went on, people got sick, some people died, there were no states of emergency, no school closures. The economy barely was affected by the pandemic. There was a recession in the United States in 1957. It was very small and had nothing to do with the pandemic. What Larry Summers did with David Cutler last year was to estimate the cost of COVID-19, adding in all the different costs, not just the contraction of, of GDP, but the impacts on health, premature death, long-term health impairment. And their estimate was that the actual cost of COVID would be something in the region of 90% of gross domestic product. And it may even uh, turn out that that was an underestimate. Uh, we'll see. 
they assumed a cumulative death toll of 625,000 by the end of, of 2021. So the argument I want to put to you is that this disaster is in fact historically more striking economically than in terms of public health. This is not a huge pandemic by historical standards, but it is a huge economic shock by historic standards. It's very hard to find in uh, the long runs of uh, output data, such a huge discontinuity as happened in 2020. Now, as I mentioned, the distinction between man-made and natural disasters is a slightly artificial one, uh, even although we intuitively make it. I love these cartoons from 1919 uh, from North Carolina, which uh, are subtitled The Way the Germans Did It at uh, Chateau Thierry. And you can see a German machine gunner mowing down American soldiers. And the way North Carolinians do it at home. Uh, and that somebody sneezing over uh, his fellow citizens with comparable effect. Uh, th that captures one of the central ideas of doom, that in the end, whether we're using a machine gun or, or just sneezing, our, our behavior is crucial to the way in which excess mortality happens. And you cannot understand the enormous variance in excess mortality from country to country without recognizing that it's the same pathogen, the same virus, albeit with various different mutations, eliciting completely different policy responses. The difference between Taiwan and Brazil is a drastic difference. And it cannot be explained in terms of differences in virus variants or the biological features of the population. We need to uh, have a political explanation for the enormous difference in excess mortality. I try to relate the man-made and the natural disasters by showing that by the standards of modern warfare, uh, COVID is the second tier disaster closer to the Korean War in terms of its impact, nowhere close to the world wars. This is important because in, in history, after pandemics, wars are the big cause of excess mortality, uh, of premature death. And so if you're trying to think about disaster in history, you need to spend as much time talking about war as about plague. But then, as I said, if you look at the fiscal and monetary effects of COVID, if all you knew was the trajectory of the federal debt and of the Federal Reserve balance sheet, if that was all you knew about the United States, you would conclude that World War III had happened. Because the trajectory of the federal debt since the global financial crisis is pretty similar to its trajectory in World War II. And we've actually arrived at exactly the same place, north of 100% of GDP, that the United States reached in 1945-46. The reason we had such a huge economic disaster is that for the first time in history, really, we used a whole variety of measures known as lockdowns for short to combat contagion because we could. You could not have confined everybody to their home in 1957 because you couldn't have done really any work from home in 1957. Most people uh, in the world didn't even have telephones in 1957, never mind the internet. So we had an option that didn't really exist in the past to say to people, you cannot socialize or go to work, you must remain in your home. And if you can't work from home, we'll just give you money. This is a new policy option that the internet has made possible. And I think it explains a part of the scale of the economic shock. But here's an important point that Austin Goolsby and John Cochran, two very different American economists have both made. Even if we had not issued lockdown orders, people would have adapted the behavior anyway. We know that mobility data turned down drastically in the United States before shelter-in-place orders were issued. We know that in those states that did not impose lockdowns, mobility data went down anyway. People are not totally stupid. 
if there's a new and contagious virus that has some probability of making you sick or killing you, then people will stay at home. They will not go out to restaurants. The restaurants emptied before any shelter in place order was issued. The open table data show that clearly. So it wasn't just that we imposed lockdowns. It is also the fact that that populations adapted very rapidly to the new threat. And that too caused a significant shock to all those parts of the economy that relied on people getting out of their homes and driving to retail uh, or leisure uh, locations. As I mentioned, a key variable in all disasters is human error. And in the book, I try to lighten a little bit the tone by looking at some famous disasters in which by the standards of a pandemic, not many people died. The Titanic, which everybody knows about, was not the worst shipping disaster in history by any means, but it's the most famous. The Hindenburg airship disaster didn't really kill that many people at all, but it did produce one brilliant photograph, which I, I think enjoyed a new lease of life after Led Zeppelin put it on the cover of one of their, their albums. What I try to show in the book is why those disasters happened. Although there was a strong temptation to blame the sinking of the Titanic on the chairman or chief executive of the White Star Line, that was not really what happened. It was not really credibly to be blamed on him. And it, actually, the reasons for the large numbers of drownings when the Titanic went down are not well understood. If you're interested in the Titanic, my book will tell you what really happened and whose fault it really was. It's not what you think. Uh, and similarly in the Hindenburg uh, case, it turns out not to have been a fundamental error in the direction of the Zeppelin company. It was a fundamental error by the pilot uh, that led to the disaster. This brings us to our populist uh, leaders and the extraordinarily powerful temptation that we feel to blame excess mortality entirely on them. Now, they made and continue to make mistakes, so many that it would be another book to list them all. I think President Bolsonaro has actually made more mistakes than Donald Trump, which is a major achievement. Because if nothing else, Trump's administration got vaccination right. Because Operation Warp Speed was the one thing that went well in 2020. And that has not been an achievement of Bolsonaro's administration. The book does not in any way defend these people. It criticizes them in pretty harsh language. But I think if we conclude that we had significant excess mortality because our presidents or prime ministers were populist imbeciles, we will be letting ourselves off too lightly and letting a lot of other people off too lightly and failing to learn the right lesson from this disaster. The idea, just to illustrate what I mean, that the United States would not have had 600,000 excess deaths if Joe Biden had somehow got the job a year early is a delusion. And I'm happy to go into my reasons for thinking that in the discussion, but let me, let me try to simplify the point here. In 1986, the space shuttle Challenger blew up. And the immediate response of the press corps in Washington was to try to blame it on Ronald Reagan by saying that the White House had rushed the launch because they wanted to mention it in the State of the Union address. This was totally untrue. There was never any connection between the White House and the launch. Richard Feynman, the great physicist at Caltech, was brought in to be a part of the public inquiry. And Feynman was the one, with a bit of help from some insiders at NASA, who showed that the real point of failure that led to the space shuttle disaster was in the NASA middle management. The engineers knew that the O-rings that were there to prevent fuel leakage would fail at low temperatures. They knew that. They told the bureaucrats, there's a 1%, one in 100 chance this thing blows up. 
which is actually a pretty dangerous uh, probability for for something that was being launched very regularly. As Feynman said, you're telling me the thing is going to blow up at some point? Yes. But there were people at NASA who did not want to convey that information to the people who were funding the space shuttle program. And so they said the probability of failure was one in 100,000, three orders of magnitude lower. And the enigmatic figure of Mr. Kingsbury, the official that the engineers could never get to take a meeting, seems to me highly significant in our story. Why did the United States, which was on paper best prepared for a pandemic of all countries in the world, according to a 2019 survey, fail so badly to deal with COVID-19? Why was there no testing for months after the beginning of the pandemic? Why was there no attempt at contact tracing? Why did nobody successfully protect the vulnerable in elderly care homes? And why were no quarantines enforced on travelers? It is very, very easy to say it was old Donald Trump's fault. But I can assure you, not one of those failures can be attributed to his role. And those are the failures that are the principal reason for the hundreds of thousands of deaths. All the mistakes he made certainly raised the death toll. But I don't know by how much, and I don't think we can exactly say, but not by, I would guess, more than 10%. Who is the Mr. Kingsbury in this story? The answer is the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness, whose job it was to be prepared for a pandemic, a man named Robert Cadleck, who in 2018 gave remarkably revealing lecture at the University of Texas. Shortly after the new pandemic preparedness plan had been published. And in the lecture, he said, if we don't build this, by which he meant an effective insurance policy against a pandemic, we're going to be SOL, which is American shorthand for shit out of luck, should we ever be confronted with it. We're whistling in the dark a little bit. When I listened to the, the YouTube of this lecture, I was kind of amazed because he was the guy whose one job it was basically admitting that the plan wouldn't work, that they had a pandemic preparedness plan. As long as there was no pandemic, it would be fine. If there was a pandemic, we'd be shit out of luck. Ultimately, what happened in most countries in the Western world, and I include Latin America in that, was a failure of the public health bureaucracy. Presidents and prime ministers certainly made matters worse, but I don't believe they can have been the decisive variable because Belgium did not have a populist prime minister, and it did even worse than the UK. Peru was basically being run by its Congress. They impeached the president out of office, and they did even worse than Brazil. You can't convince me that the key variable here is populist leadership for that reason, and also because the key point of failure, as in the Space Shuttle Challenger, was further down the chain of command. The people whose job it was did not do what their counterparts did in Taiwan and in South Korea and in New Zealand and in Australia, which was early detection, early action, ramp up testing, trace the people who have been infected and the people that they have had contact with, isolate anybody infected or who you think is uh, infected, and thereby prevent the spread of the virus. We know that was possible, and we know it was possible in democracies because all the countries I just mentioned are democracies. Why did they get it right and most European and American countries get it wrong? That's the question. And I don't think the answer is populist presidents much as one may be tempted to hate them. I want to add just a couple more points and then I'll wrap for questions. The next mistake we're making in the United States is to pour kerosene on the economic barbecue. And you don't need to take it from me. This is Larry Summers' uh, I think prescient warning that if you continue to do massive fiscal support for an economy that is rapidly recovering for a pandemic, uh, 
as if it's a financial crisis that you're dealing with, you are going to cause an inflationary surprise. We are already in that process. I think it's the 1960s, and maybe that's appropriate because they keep telling me that Joe Biden is Lyndon Johnson. Not an analogy I would be wanting to draw if I were president, but there you go. And uh, you can see what happened in the 60s. You went from below 2% inflation suddenly all the way up to 6% because basically of fiscal and monetary policy overreach. And that was on a small scale compared with what we're doing today. There is though one point worth adding, and that is that historically war has played a very big part in shifting inflation expectations. And what would really finish off the, the job would be an escalation in the US-China Cold War, which I've been writing about for a couple of years now. That's why the book ends by exploring the probability of a hot war between the US and China, because that would be a really big disaster. If you think about the way that sentiment towards China has become more negative all over the developed world in the last year, you can see that we are in many ways in a Cold War frame of mind. That is very obvious here in the United States. And I like to remind people that the Cold War was not always cold. It became very hot indeed in 1950 when North Korea invaded South Korea. A war over Taiwan is a much more likely disaster than most people recognize. I think it could happen as soon as next year. I'm happy to talk more about that. But the reason that I want to end with this scenario is that most people are not thinking enough about it because we've got used to small wars that don't really matter. They matter to the people in Iraq and they matter to the people in Afghanistan, but the wars, the so-called war on terror did not significantly impact American life. A war against China over Taiwan would, because that would be a really big war. My concluding reflection is that doom teaches us a broad lesson. The next disaster is probably not the one you're expecting. There is a whole industry of climate change conferences. At Davos in January 2020, the principal topic of the conference was climate change. And I sometimes think there are some people who can only imagine that form of disaster. And now I don't discount the risks that climate change has already created and will undoubtedly create more of if we carry on emitting CO2 on the scale that we currently do. But when I say we, I don't really mean we the West, because it's almost all being done by China. 48% of the increase in CO2 emissions since the Paris Climate Agreement can be attributed to China, and a big chunk, about a quarter, uh, to India. So we're not really having a serious discussion about climate change these days, because the, the serious discussion would be, how do you constrain the big Asian economies from burning coal? As long as we're not talking about that, as long as we're pretending that it's all about burning the rainforest, this is a non-discussion that will achieve precisely nothing. Unfortunately, we as human beings have all kinds of forms of myopia and cognitive bias. We will continue to have grand conferences on climate change, until the next disaster, which will presumably take a completely different form. And we will be just as surprised by that next disaster as we were by COVID-19. And unfortunately, I'm afraid, if we conclude that the disaster was all the fault of a few populist leaders, and all we need to do is get rid of them, the next disaster will also expose that our bureaucracy does not have a good plan for the disaster, even if one exists on paper. And I'll leave it there and invite your questions. Thank you so much, Professor. It was brilliant. And I can honestly say that your book, uh, you are a hero because you wrote a book this wonderful with 50 pages of notes, 56 pages of notes, and with the most uh, interesting titles. For example, my favorite one is chapter seven, From the Boogie Woogie Flu to Ebola in Town. And even Monty, Monty Python is ironically here so we have some questions and everybody unfortunately i cannot open the the microphones but uh let's see let's go to the first Andrei. question yes Fernando. Andrei, 
Yeah. Uh, if you may allow me to make a question. Sure. Mm -hmm. Go on. The first uh, one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, Professor Liam Ferguson, is a, um, a very pleasure to have you here. And everybody here, is, I think, is proud to have your company here in, in São Paulo. I, I would like uh, uh, to, to uh, thank you for accepting my invitation. It was last year. I think you, uh, you was researching and, and writing your book. Um, um, I want to say too that uh, Jussara, uh, uh, my wife that is here with us and me, both of us are historian and uh, we appreciate your, your work, your, your books uh, since a long time. Uh, I, I want, uh, want to, to say to you that we are very happy to help your family buying your books. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, you're welcome. And uh, uh, I just want to say one, one more thing. Uh, we appreciate a lot um the way you um you you look at history we appreciate um when you see the contingents in history uh history of the choice point of view the counterfactual history too uh and so uh we appreciate too uh a huge number uh of aspect of of data uh that you put all in connection. And so, uh, very thank you. Um, I am proud to have you here. But I thank have you. a question. I have a question too. Um, that, that's something that, that you say on the end of, our, of your lecture, but uh, maybe you have uh, some, some things, some other things to, to do, to, to say with us. My question is uh, an important and even gloomy aspect in your book is that you understand that we are already in second war and, and uh, second cold war uh, with the risk of even a real war between United States, United States and China. Am I correct in, in this point of view? Yes. I think the, and thank you very much, Fernando, for your kind words and for the, the invitation. I am keenly interested in how we as historians can apply our kind of knowledge to contemporary problems. I think the academic historical profession has not done a good job of, of showing the power of history as, as a method of thinking. And we've allowed ourselves to, to be marginalized by economists and social scientists and indeed epidemiologists whose models are in fact a very poor guide to the way the world works. Historical thinking is about capturing complexity and showing how very difficult, indeed impossible, it would be to model the historical process. It was another Neil Ferguson who played a very big part in the pandemic, the epidemiologist who spells his name slightly differently from me. And I do think that if more attention had been paid to me than to that Neil Ferguson, uh, we might have arrived at better policy outcomes, at least in the UK. So the critical problem about the US-China relationship is that it's almost too obvious that we're in Cold War II. And for many intellectuals, the obvious is sometimes repellent. It is obvious that China under Xi Jinping has reverted to a Marxist-Leninist theory of power. It is obvious that China is engaged in a, a, a systematic uh, technological competition uh, with the United States, that it intends to weaponize its technological gains both domestically to control its population and internationally to expand its power. The symptoms of Cold War are all there. The only difference really between the US 
Soviet Cold War. And this one is the great degree of economic interdependency that has evolved, particularly since around 2001. But my view is that that is not a reason to think Cold War II isn't happening. Uh, in the case of Britain and Germany prior to 1914, there was a very high level of economic interdependence. They were each other's biggest trading partners. That did not stop World War I from happening. Economic interdependence does not preclude a Cold War, actually makes it easier for China to steal technology and to engage in espionage. It is very easy indeed to do espionage uh, if you are Beijing today, much easier than it was for Moscow in the 1950s and 1960s. We knew exactly how many Soviet agents were in the United States, and that was a small number. Uh, with a relatively small number of unidentified spies. Hundreds of thousands of Chinese are in the United States. So interpenetration or interdependence does not make Cold War impossible. It makes it easier. And of course, the other big difference is that China is much closer to catching up with the United States in economic and technological terms than the Soviet Union ever was. The Soviet economy was never more than 44% the size of the US economy on a purchasing power parity basis. On a PPP basis, China has already overtaken the United States. On a current dollar basis, it could catch up by 2030. So this is a, a Cold War we could lose. And that seems to me to be the simplest observation one can make about the geopolitical situation today. What's amazing is how few intellectuals in the West want to face this. Because every time I say it, the learned professors at Harvard and at Yale say, oh, that's an, an inappropriate analogy. And this is, the, this is when intellectual sophistication can get in the way of seeing the obvious. Uh, just in the same way as in January of last year, I said, this is a pandemic. Why are we talking about climate change at Davos? There's a pandemic now. It was obvious, but the people who wanted to be clever said, oh no, this won't be worse than the seasonal influenza. It's the same intellectual deformity that impels people to say things that they think are clever in defiance of the historically obvious. So where we go from here depends on the Biden administration. If it decides to play hardball with China, it may have to go to war over Taiwan at some point, because there's no question in my mind that Xi Jinping wants to take control of Taiwan. That is his ultimate ambition. And he cannot do it by any other means than force because the Taiwanese have defeated the attempts to do it by stealth. The Chinese attempt to penetrate the Taiwanese political system totally failed. Uh, so at some point there's gonna be a showdown over Taiwan unless Xi Jinping is hit by an automobile tomorrow. And I just don't know what the Biden administration will do. They may uh, honor their commitments to Taiwan, or they may blink and back down. But neither scenario is a good one. I'll leave it there because I want to leave time for other questions. Sure. There are many questions. We are not going to be able to talk all of them. but I'll let's do see. short answers for the no, others. No, don't worry. Here. Don't worry. We want to listen to you all the time. Don't worry. Uh, thank you, Leo. Thank you, thank Fernando. You. Uh, Professor, there's a question about Dr. Anthony Fauci, that is, he, he is being heavily criticized in conservative circles, latest because of emails about the origins of the virus. Is he being scapegoated, blamed because he's at the top? Well, not, not really, because he wasn't and isn't at, at the top, or at least he wasn't at the top most of last year. He became a public figure, despite not, in fact, having a particularly important role because he was ready to go on the record and uh and say things that often uh disagreed with uh, the views of trump so the media gave him airtime to do that i don't think um uh that fauci is a god uh it's clear that he made uh, misjudgments last year as did most people uh, but nor do I think he's a villain. I actually think, uh, on the whole, he has acted in good faith. 
The problem in the United States is that every issue is now a political or partisan issue. Issues that belonged in the domain of, of public health a few decades ago have become partisan issues. Vaccines were not a political issue in the 1950s. People were just glad when they came up with vaccines that worked. Today, they've become political issues. So Anthony Fauci's problem is that he would like to be an unpolitical figure, but it is impossible to be an unpolitical public health official in the United States today. Uh, and that means that we generate a great deal of heat and not much light arguing about issues that really don't belong in the domain of partisan politics. A good example of where we have got into difficulties is that a perfectly legitimate hypothesis that the virus originated in a laboratory leak was censored out of existence and rubbished by people who had no reason to have high confidence in the other hypothesis, which was the official Chinese answer to the question, where did it come from? Answer from a wet market, for a, uh, from a market where live wild animals were for sale. Neither hypothesis is yet proven. But what was shocking to me was that the lab leak hypothesis was just discredited uh, and classified as a conspiracy theory and fake news and then censored on social media. I think that's a bigger problem than the one uh, that I talked about earlier, the problem in which everything gets blamed on the person at the top. In the United States, we have the problem that normal debate about public health issues has become almost impossible because of the role the internet plays. Thank you so much. Uh, we are going to, I'm going to mention two, two of your pages because the question is about uh, the human part at the end of the pandemic. Are we going to be able to be more human, more altruistic? On page uh, 337, Professor, you wrote, disaster can bring people together, increasing altruistic behavior. And there is some evidence that this happened in 2020. And then uh, the last page and the last sentences of your book, page 396, that I found very beautiful and I'm going to read to everybody and I would like you to comment later. Mostly for the lucky man, the, for, for the lucky many, life after the disaster goes on, changed in a few ways, but on the whole, remarkably, reassuringly, boringly the same. With astonishing speed, we put our brush with mortality behind us and blithely carry on forgetful of those who were not so lucky, regardless of the next disaster that lies in wait. So uh, now, after just uh, in June 2021, what do you think about our altruism? And do you think this is going, this is happening now? We are putting everything behind us. The good news is that the end of the world never quite comes, despite... <laughs> the many predictions of doom, of, of apocalypse. Uh, and good news is that when disaster strikes, even if our, our bureaucracy fails, uh, ordinary people try their best and behave in impressively altruistic ways. Uh, that, that's the good news about the species. Uh, we also get over disasters remarkably quickly. I'm, I'm struck by the, the rapid pace of normalization in the United States and in my own life. I flew all the way to the East Coast uh, earlier this week and all the way back, and the differences are there. It's very annoying to wear a mask all the way from New York to San Francisco, but the normality is also there. Uh, so it does feel as if life goes on with with small changes, but reverts to normal with remarkable speed. And we also revert to a kind of um, insouciance about the next disaster. I'll give you an example. We've had repeated news stories in the last three weeks about cyber attacks uh, on parts of uh, the US infrastructure, the energy supply and the food supply. It's obvious that one of the next big disasters to worry about is a really big cyber attack. If, if there is a US-China war, that's exactly what they will do. You can expect a massive attempt to disrupt uh, the US critical infrastructure, and it's being prepared in plain sight. We see this. Uh, 
Do we really have a plan for that? Do we have a plan for no internet? Do we have a plan for no cell phones? How will we cope if everything is down? I don't think we, any of us have given that a fraction of the amount of thought we need to give it. And I don't see any evidence of any organization that I'm involved with having a plan for that. So I, I sense that we're both impressively resilient as a species and depressingly myopic. No sooner is one disaster coming to an end than we blithely fail to learn the lessons from it. And it's not, I think, difficult to see what the big lesson is. It is not, we need a new president, though that may help in some respects. It is, it is that we need to look at the way our bureaucracy prepares for disaster and change it so that we're more like Taiwan and less like the United States was or Brazil was last year. But I don't see that lesson being learned. And so we'll go, we're going to walk into the next disaster having conferences about climate change, and then we'll be such surprised that a massive cyber attack is the problem. That's, that's the sort of the thing that made me want to write this book before the pandemic was over. I want to scream on as many Zoom calls as possible. Do not make the same mistake again that you just made with a pandemic. For years, you said a pandemic was likely to happen. It was a gray rhino that you saw coming towards you. A pandemic is likely to happen. TED talk after TED talk. And then when it happened, your plan was totally worthless and didn't work. That was the burden of Dominic Cummings' testimony in London uh, just the other day. We, we had a plan. It was useless. And then we stuck to it until it was too late. And then we panicked and had a lockdown. It was hugely disruptive. That happened in most countries. So whatever the next disaster is, and I have no idea what it will be, and nobody else does, I really, really hope that we don't have a plan for that disaster, which is just as useless. Uh, because there's time to do something about it. There, there is time to get serious about disaster preparedness before the next disaster strikes, but much less time than most people appear to realize. Thank you. Thank you. You can scream whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> and wave That's, my hands yes perfect uh you said that and uh, uh i think you talked about uh during your lecture as well about the about aids and then you said that first covid19 will be to social life what aids was to sexual life that it will change our behavior though by no means enough to avert a significant number of premature deaths and then Uh, uh, after more than three, de the three decades and 30 million deaths from HIV, this is still happening. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, well, this is a very important lesson. Sure. We've had a worse pandemic than COVID in our lifetimes. It was the HIV AIDS pandemic, and it's killed mm -hmm. more than 30 million people, so maybe 10 times as many. Mm -hmm. And what, what I learned from studying that was that even after it was obvious how the virus was spread, People did not alter their behavior enough to stop it. And the same has been true really in the past six months. By, let's say, this time last year, we knew enough about this virus to understand that it spread indoors, uh, that it's, it was particularly in crowded indoor locations that it spread. Uh, we knew who was vulnerable. We knew all of that. And we didn't alter our behavior nearly enough. Why was there a second wave in the United States at the end of last year, because people got bored of social distancing and bored of masks and bored of being stuck in their homes. And they all went and celebrated Thanksgiving and Christmas like it was over. And the result was utterly predictable. You could totally predict what was going to happen uh, as those behaviors relaxed. And this was before vaccines had even passed their phase three trials. I mean, there were people acting like they were already vaccinated because Pfizer said the, the vaccine worked. So I think we can see that, and this is unfortunately the note on which I have to end because I have another event to go to. I think the general conclusion is that we have uh, all kinds of cognitive biases that make it very difficult for us to assess risk and uncertainty properly, adjust our behavior appropriately, Uh, and, and deal with new threats to our, uh, 
our lifespan when they arise. And this will be true, I think, of COVID as well as it has been true of HIV AIDS. This disease will not go away, it will be with us for many years, and it will kill people prematurely who fail to learn and apply the lessons of the past year, just as people have been dying of HIV AIDS by having sex without condoms when they knew that they really should not do that. So I, I, I have to conclude on a somewhat gloomy note, uh, but I fear that uh, the job of the historian is, is to inject into moments of euphoria a certain doom and gloom, but also to remind people that the end of the world is not our problem. It's not that the world is going to end and the planet is going to be uh, annihilated. That will happen in a very, 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 very long time from now. The problem is just dealing with disasters, and those will keep happening with arbitrary frequency, and they will kill people, and sometimes people close to us, maybe even us, if we don't do a better job of prepping for them. Professor, thank you, thank you so much. And do not worry, we are in Brazil. We are unfortunately very used to gloom and doom. So <laughs> thank you so much for your presence. Thank you, thank thank you, you everybody. Thank you everybody for joining. It's been a real pleasure. And I look forward to coming down to Sao Paulo and uh, things become a little easier uh, with respect to travel. Uh, it's always a city I enjoy visiting. And uh, I wish you all... Good health and uh, and a rapid uh, vaccination and return to uh, whatever is left of normality. Yes. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. <clears throat>